Hello, AP Stats students, and welcome to AP Daily Practice Sessions. In this series of videos, we are going to focus in on practice multiple choice and practice free response in the hopes of getting you prepared for the AP Statistics exam. Now, I can tell you that each one of the questions that we've chosen to go into these videos uh, are very carefully chosen because we know they cover content that you absolutely have to know for the AP exam. So if you can stick with us through all these videos, you can be sure that you can walk into the AP exam feeling confident. So let's get started. My name is Luke Wilcox. I am an AP stats teacher at East Kentwood High School in Kentwood, Michigan. Go Falcons, where I've been an AP stats teacher for about 20 years now. I've also been an AP exam grader for many years. And so I'll do my best to bring all of those experiences into the discussions that we're gonna have about these practice questions within these videos. Now in this first session, I'm gonna take you through six multiple choice questions, all covering content at the beginning half of the AP Stats course. Now I highly recommend that you download these questions first and try them on your own, then come back to the video to look through the solutions. So the link to those questions is on the video or down below in the description. Download those, give those a try, and then come back here to see how you did. So here is question number one. A company determines the mean and standard deviation of the number of sick days taken by its employees in one year. Which of the following is the best description of the standard deviation? And here are the five answer choices. Now, this question is about the interpretation of the standard deviation. And in order to arrive at that, let's start by looking at the formula for standard deviation. Now, this formula is provided for you on the formula sheet for the AP exam. And if we break this down by starting on the inside, you can see that the first calculation that's done here is to take each one of the individual values in a list and figure out how far it is away from the mean. In other words, we're finding the distance from each individual value to the mean. Now, some of those are negative and some are positive, so we end up squaring those in order to get the squared distances. And then in the next part of the formula, you can see that essentially what we're doing here is finding an average, adding them all up, dividing by the number of numbers. Now, this is going to give us the average squared distance from the mean. The final step in the calculation is to take the square root so that standard deviation is the average distance from each individual value to the mean. So now that we know that, let's go back to our answer choices here and see which one we like. I'm gonna start with answer choice A. Approximately the mean distance between the number of sick days taken by individual employees and the mean number of sick days taken by all employees. Now that sounds exactly like we were what we were just talking about in the formula. I like this answer choice A, but I wanna make sure that the other answer choices are incorrect. So let's look at each one of those individually. Answer choice B, you can see is referring to the median distance. And we don't want the median distance, we want the mean distance or the average distance. So answer choice B is out. Answer choice C is talking about the distance between the greatest number of sick days in the mean, and it really should be each individual value in the mean. So answer choice C is out. Answer choice D is looking for the distance between the fewest sick days and the most sick days. Now that's the distance between the minimum and the maximum. And we know that that distance is called the range of the data. That's a different measure of variability, not the same as the standard deviation. So that one is out. And then finally, answer choice E, you can see in this one, we're looking for the middle 50% of the distribution. Uh, this is what's called the interquartile range or the IQR. And that's a different measure of variability besides standard deviation. So that answer choice is out which means that our gut instinct to begin with, answer choice A is in fact the correct answer here for number one. A researcher collected data on the latitude in degrees north of the equator and the average low temperature in degrees Fahrenheit for a random sample of cities in Europe. The data were used to create the following equation for the least squares regression line. And you can see the equation given. Which of the following is the best interpretation of the slope of the line? Now this question is all about interpreting slope and you can see all of our answer choices here. But before we look at those, I wanna talk about the best way to interpret slope for AP statistics. Now, in order to do that, we first have to identify the slope in the equation, which you can see here is negative 0.70. 
Now I'm going to take you back to your first algebra class ever, where you probably learned that slope was the change in y over the change in x. Now this slope of negative 0.70, we could think of that as being a fraction over 1. And in the context of the problem, that is the change in average low temperature divided by the change in latitude. Now for AP stats, here's the best way to interpret slope. We say for a change of latitude of one, we predict that the change in the average low temperature would go down by 0.7 degrees. Now looking at all of our answer choices here, let's examine the first part of the interpretation, which should be talking about a change in latitude of one. Now answer choices A and B say exactly that. It says for each one degree north of the equator. And the other three answer choices are all incorrect interpretations. So let's get rid of those three answer choices, leaving us with just answer choice A and B. Now the difference between those two answer choices, you can see in answer choice A, it's talking about an increase in temperature. Well, we know that the slope is a negative value, which means answer choice A is incorrect, leaving us with the correct interpretation for slope, answer choice B. All right, moving on to number three, which of the following is not a characteristic of stratified random sampling? And we have our five answer choices here. Now notice we are looking for the statement that is not a characteristic. In other words, we're looking for the false statement out of these five. Now, before we look at those answer choices, I wanna make sure you understand the idea of a stratified random sample. And I'm gonna do that with a quick example here. So let's suppose that we had a population of high school students. And we wanted to take a stratified random sample of 100 students. Now, what we would do first is we would take that population and split it into groups or strata based on some variable. In this case, the variable is the grade level. So we have ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders. So we have split the population into strata. Next, from each one of those strata, we're gonna select a simple random sample. So we would take a simple random sample of 25 freshmen, 25 sophomores, 25 juniors, and 25 seniors in order to get our sample of size 100. Now, keeping this example in mind, let's go back to our answer choices here for number three. And remember, we're looking for the statement that is false. So answer choice A says random sampling is part of the sampling procedure. Well, yeah, that's true. We took a random sample from each one of the grade levels. Now, because that's a true statement, this is not the one that we're looking for. Answer choice B says the population is divided into groups of units that are similar on some characteristic. Well, this is true in our example as well because we divided the population of high school students into grade levels, where each uh, grade level, all the freshmen were ninth graders. So this is a true statement, which means we're not looking for that answer. Answer choice C, it says the strata are based on facts known before the sample is selected. Well, we definitely know the grade level of students before we selected this sample. So this is a true statement, that one's out. And then D, each individual unit in the population belongs to one and only one of the strata. Well, students only belong to one grade level at a time. So this is a true statement, which means that answer choice is out. Now our final answer choice says, every possible subset of the population of the desired sample size has an equal chance of being selected. Now remember, we were selecting a sample of size 100. And let's consider the special case that the sample of 100 was all seniors. Is it possible that we could have a sample of 100 seniors if we're using a stratified random sample? No, that's not possible because we're taking 25 from each grade level. So it's actually impossible that the sample would be all 100 seniors which means this statement, every possible subset of the population has an equal chance of being selected, is not true. And remember, we were looking for the statement that was false. So answer choice E is the correct answer here. All right, question four. An experiment has three mutually exclusive outcomes, A, B, and C. If the probability of A is 0.12, probability of B is 0.61, and the probability of C is 0.27, which of the following must be true? And then we're given three statements to consider here. Now there's two very important ideas that I wanna review in this question. And that is, what does it mean for events to be mutually exclusive? And what does it mean for events to be independent? So let's start there. And I'm gonna start with mutually exclusive. 
Now, what it means for two events to be mutually exclusive is that they cannot occur at the same time. Now, if they cannot occur at the same time, when we find the probability of one event and the other event, well, because they can't occur at the same time, that probability has to be equal to zero. Now, the other, other equation that's true for mutually exclusive events is that the probability of A or B is just equal to the probability of A plus the probability of B. We don't have to worry about subtracting out the overlap because there isn't any overlap for mutually exclusive events. Now let's think about the idea of independent events. And what that means is knowing whether one event has occurred does not change the probability that the other event will occur. And if you have two events that are independent, then the probability of A and B can be found by simply multiplying those two probabilities together, the probability of A times the probability of B. So now that we've reviewed those two important concepts, let's go back to our three statements and try and decide which of those are true. And I'm going to start with the easy ones here. Statement two says that the probability of A and B is zero. Now, remember, we know uh, that A, B, and C are mutually exclusive. They can't occur at the same time. So, of course, this is a true statement. Now, also, because we know that all these events are mutually exclusive, if I want to find the probability of B or C, I can just simply add the two probabilities together. So that's also a true statement. Now, I think statement one is the trickiest here. It says A and C are independent. Now, let's just suppose to start that this is true, that A and C are independent. Now, if they are, then the probability of A and C can be found by simply multiplying those two probabilities together. So we'd take those two probabilities, multiply them together to get a value of 0.0324. But remember, it says that events A and C are mutually exclusive and cannot occur at the same time. So the probability of A and C should be equal to zero. It should not be equal to 0.0324. Now this means that statement one is an incorrect or a false statement. And that therefore means that the correct answer for number four is answer choice D, two and three. All right, question number five says, random variable X is normally distributed with a mean 10 and a standard deviation three. And random variable y is normally distributed with mean 9 and standard deviation 4. If x and y are independent, which of the following describes the distribution of y minus x? So we are combining two random variables here by subtracting y minus x, and we'd like to describe the distribution. Now that usually means we're going to talk about shape, center, and variability. And the shape on all five of the answer choices is the same. That's normal. So we're good there. So let's move to the center. And you can see here, we have to calculate the mean of this random variable y minus x, which is very easy to do. It's just simply the mean of y minus the mean of x. So we plug in the values given in the problem, and we see that that mean should be equal to negative one. Now this allows us to eliminate a couple of answer choices over here because they have the incorrect mean. Now the last thing that we have to do here is to calculate the standard deviation. And what students often want to do is they want to subtract the standard deviations or maybe even add the standard deviations. But you got to remember, one does not simply add standard deviations. What we can add is the variances. Now, that means we have to calculate the variance for each, which is easy to do. We just take the standard deviations there and we square them and add those two variances together. Now, this is going to give us the variance of y minus x. But remember, we want the standard deviation of y minus x. So you have to take the square root of the 25, which will give you a standard deviation of 5, leaving us with the correct answer choice here of answer choice C. All right, question number six. In one region of the country, the mean length of stay in hospitals is 5.5 days with standard deviation 2.6 days. Because many patients stay in the hospital for considerably more days, the distribution of length of stay is strongly skewed to the right. Consider random samples of size 100 taken from the distribution with the mean length of stay X bar recorded for each sample. Which of the following is the best description of the sampling distribution of X bar? So this question is asking us for a description of the sampling distribution. And once again, I wanna talk about shape, center, and variability. So let's start by thinking about the shape of the sampling distribution of X bar. Now in the problem, we are told that the population distribution is strongly skewed to the right. 
but we're also told that we're taking samples of size 100, a very large sample size, in fact, larger than 30, which means that we can use the central limit theorem here, which would say that the sampling distribution of X bar is approximately normal. So even though the population distribution is skewed to the right, because of the central limit theorem, the sampling distribution is approximately normal. Now that means I can get rid of these first three answer choices there, A, B, and C. And we are now just left with answer choices D and E. Now notice that the mean is 5.5 for each of those. So it's all gonna come down to the standard deviation here. And remember, we want the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of X bar. Now we can get that formula from the formula sheet for the AP exam. It's just sigma over the square root of N. And then we plug in our numbers from the problem and we get a standard deviation of 0 0.26, which means the correct answer for this one is answer choice E. So I hope that this video has been helpful for you. I also hope that you will join me in the next session, session two, where we will go through two free response questions on one of the most challenging topics in all of AP statistics, that of probability. Hope to see you soon.